We're talking today with Phil Cole of Hoffman Estates, Illinois. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, uh, Phil, to begin with, give us some background on yourself. Uh, start out, uh, where and when were you born? I was born in uh, Oak Park, Illinois uh, in 1953. In Oak Park, the only reason I was Oak Park, I lived in Chicago, mm -hmm. was because the hospital was across the street from Chicago. Okay. All right. And so, uh, now did you grow up in Chicago or did you move around? Yeah, in Chicago, Northwest Side. Okay. And what did your family do for a living when you were a kid? Um, my dad was a truck driver. Uh, then my parents got divorced. And then my stepfather was a carpenter. Okay. And then eventually my mother bought a pet store. So, I All right. out at the pet store. Okay. Uh, now, was your dad in the service in World War II? No, after that, I think. I'm not very good right. at this. <laughs> because, because you have an interesting picture of it. Yes, he was in Malta. Uh, and it had to be in the 40s, so yeah, I guess at the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. And he got injured, so. And then Pr Princess Elizabeth at that point visited him in the hospital. Okay, yeah. So, and that, that might possibly have been a little after the war ended, or at least when it got safe to go travel down the Mediterranean for her. I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's a little bit unusual there. All right. Uh, and where did you go to high school? Went to Lane Tech High School. 5,000 guys. My class was 1,100, so. People, people who went to Lane go, oh, I had a dad who went to Lane. Did you know him? Like, I go, you know, 1,100 guys in my class. I didn't even know all of them. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and what year did you graduate? 1971. Okay. So you're in high school while the, the Vietnam War is, is, is sort of uh, ebbing and flowing a, a little bit. How aware were you of all of that? Uh, very aware because I was in ROTC okay. in high school. So it was very odd. Every Wednesday we had uh, uniform inspections. So we had to wear our uniform on the bus all the way to school, and it was very odd. And um, what kinds of responses do you get on the bus or elsewhere? Both positive and negative. You know, some people were like, oh, you know, good for you. And other people were like, uh, you, you know, baby killer. And it's like, I'm an ROTC, I'm a high school student, you know. So it was very odd. At one point we had, um, as ROTC, we had to, the school asked us to stand by all of the uh, fire alarms for the day because this uh, SDS was supposed to come and free us from the tyranny of education. All right. So how did you wind up in ROTC? Um, it was either that or PE. Okay. <laughs> and, my, and my thought was, yeah, I'd rather march around than do push-ups and pull-ups and things like that. Okay. And what did the ROTC high school curriculum consist of? Uh, marching around. Uh, we actually had a gun range in the basement of the high school, so we, you know, we had M1s that we took apart and put back together again and things like that, cleaned them, know, knew how to do the nomenclature of the guns and things like that. All right. What sort of people were instructing you? Um, current uh, uh, NCOs. Mm -hmm. We had a couple of NCOs who were in charge. Uh, Army. Yeah. And did they say anything about... Uh, anywhere they'd been or what they'd done or? They talked a little bit about it, you know. I mean, most of the classes were like 50 guys, mm -hmm. you know, so a lot of it was student leaders, student officers, you know, who would, who would run us through drills and stuff like that. Um, but occasionally, as I got to be a senior, I got to spend more time with them and would hear stories about where they'd been or, you know, I, they were, I don't remember them being uh, real proactive about trying to enlist us into the service. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and so once you graduated, what did you do? Uh, I went to work. I went to work for 70 hours a week at a steel training plant. And I learned quickly that I didn't want to work that hard the rest of my life. I would rather work smart than hard. <laughs> Seven, 70 hours a week? Yeah. Yeah. How was that even legal? I don't know. <laughs> did you get did. overtime? Uh, I did. I did. But, you know, I needed the money. I had moved out. When I graduated, I moved out my own apartment. 
Um, so I needed the money for rent and everything. And um, like I said, I soon learned I needed to go to college. Okay. Now, now was the draft still going on at the point when you graduated? I, I got a number. Yeah, but fortunately, I never got called up. I was my a fairly high number. Okay. Yeah, and it didn't last too much longer after '71. It didn't. Yeah, although I enlisted in '73 and it was still going on, but yeah, I think that was right about just at the end because yeah. it was something Nixon did before he went out of office in '74 was to end the draft. But okay, so the draft was out there, but you were not at risk on a level you would have been a couple years earlier. That may be true, but we still had to get a number. And oh, yeah. I remember going with a friend going, oh, this, mm -hmm. this could be bad, you yeah. know? You, you, you didn't want a real low number, even if you weren't going to go, right. you know? All right. Now, by this time, did they have the regular lottery in place? It was just done by birthday? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So in the meantime, though, off to college, so where did you go to school? Where did you go to school? Well, I, no, I didn't. Okay. Because I couldn't, I couldn't afford it. Right. And so I decided I needed to go to college, and so I ended up enlisting. Okay. And what branch of the service did you choose? Air Force. Okay. And why the Air Force? Uh, because their uniforms are blue like my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> that's mostly true. Um, I did go, I went to one of those recruiting offices that had all of the services, mm -hmm. and I interviewed all of them. The Army would give me the best deal because I had four years of high school ROTC, right. and they would give me like two stripes. Um, I just like the Air Force. One, I, Navy, I can't swim, you know, and Army seemed like walking around a lot, and Air Force seemed kind of cool, and so I went with that. And they gave me one stripe the moment I came in. Okay. So. All right. Uh, and so when do you actually enlist? Uh, <laughs> I have an odd sense of humor. I wanted to go in April 1st, but uh, that, that wasn't <laughs> available. So I took April 2nd, 1973. Okay. Uh, and then once you enlist, and what happens to you after that? Uh, apparently, because I was, I had one stripe, um, I had to carry all the documents for all the people, all the guys going from Chicago down to uh, Texas, to where we're getting basic training. <clears throat> And at one point we stopped, I remember this vividly, we stopped and we were told stay on the plane, don't get out, you know, and I got these documents and you don't know what's going on. One kid got out, he goes, ah, I gotta go get something and I go, no, you can't, I got your stuff, we, you know, and he goes, ah, I'll be back, and I'm like, I sweated the whole time. He finally got back just at the last moment, I'm thinking, I would have gotten in trouble if he had not come back because I had all these documents. Yeah, you'd have lost him already. I, yes, it was horrible. I had one day in, an hour in, and I'm already losing people. That's not a good thing. All right. And so where are they doing the training? Uh, down in Texas at Lackland. So Lackland Air Force Base. Yeah. Uh, and San Antonio? San Antonio. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, what sort of reception do you get when you arrive at Lackland? <laughs> well, everybody's on the bus. Everybody goes into a classroom. Nobody knows what the heck's going on. Um, they talk to us, yell at us, everything else, and uh, I don't think it was like until two in the morning or something before we finally got to bed. You know, got to our dorm or barracks and got in bed. So it was not a good day. Okay. Well, now were you being processed or were you just being lectured to? Lectured to, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, because we didn't even get uniforms or anything till the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. So it was just you know them telling us what we need to do, what we're supposed to do, blah, 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 all the rules, and I'm like, oh, okay. And we're all sitting there, one, very, very tired, and, and two, kind of scared, because you don't know, it's the unknown, you know? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, did they, in, in the Army and, and the Marines, they, they, they would do a variety of unpleasant things to people when they first got there. Uh, including they put them in bed at four and get them up at six or something like that. I mean, so what happens to you in the next couple of days? Okay, well, from my experience and the people I know, uh, Air Force is a little milder than the Army and the Marines. Um, we went to bed about two and then we got up at six. Okay. All right, and you get haircuts, uniforms. Oh, yeah. 
Yes, haircuts. Yeah, <laughs> haircuts and then uniforms. Okay, 1973 haircuts that might have generated a lot of hair. Most of the guys had hair until they got through the barber shop, and then it was just bald. And I don't think that's a good look for anybody. <laughs> it was, we were not, not a pretty group. <laughs> Yeah, but you all kind of look alike at that point. We did. Well, that, that's the point, I guess, is everybody's supposed to look alike and, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when you're there, did they do any kind of aptitude testing, or had that all been done ahead of time? That had been done ahead of time. Uh, and when you enlisted, were you allowed to pick any kind of training specializations? or? Yeah, after the aptitude test, they said, well, here's your areas that you're strong in. I have to admit, my recruiter lied to me. I'm probably the only one that that's ever happened to. Um, but he said, "Yeah, no, you can pick anything you want." And I go, "Oh, okay. Well, I, you know, this radio communications analysis specialist sounds kind of cool." I said, "But I've got family in in Arizona. Are there bases in Arizona?" "Oh, yeah, we have a lot of Air Force bases in in Arizona." "Yeah, no problem." Well, if you're a radio communications analysis specialist. There's no basis in Arizona that you're going to go to. So, oh well. Okay. Uh, so, now what is the act basic training for the Air Force like at that point? Um, up at six, go to breakfast, and then do exercises or marching or or classes. You know, military customs, military courtesies. You know, those kind of things. Uh, then lunch, then dinner. And then after dinner, I think we uh, we spent most of the time polishing our shoes, you know, and making sure everything was straight in our locker and everything. Okay, so would they come and inspect the barracks and your pots and all of that? Yes, they did. Um, unbeknownst to my uh, drill instructor, he didn't know, training instructors, what we called them, mm -hmm. uh, he didn't know that I had one stripe. And I wasn't going to say anything because I assume they know everything and they know what's going on. So I didn't say a word. But I did end up being uh, assigned as squad leader. And so I was kind of responsible for helping the eight or ten guys in my squad make sure everything was okay. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things was uh, you, when you buy clothes, you get those little inspected by tags. Well, uniforms are the same way they have those in there. And we were told specifically, you got to get all those out, you know. And so one day I went through the whole squad, and they kept finding these things. The drill instructor, every time, the training instructor, every time they went through, they found these things. And I'm like, this is crazy. So I specifically went through every guy's stuff, every pocket, and there was none. Training instructor comes in, the first guy, they find six. And I'm going, no, they weren't there before. And he goes, what are you saying? They call me a liar? I go, mm, no, I'm just saying they weren't there before. Because <laughs> I checked them all. And so I, I was a bit of a challenge during the training instruction. All right. Um, now, do you get any instruction that really has anything to do with what with the Air Force in terms of like flying and aircraft? And No. No. It's basically just... Uh, customs and traditions and the rules of the road kind of thing. Uh, nothing related to flying and or our job okay. at that point in basic training. All right. So what did they do with people when they screwed up? Um, uh, they'd have to do drill, extra drill, or they'd get extra uh, KP. You know, they'd have to work in the kitchen more, things like that. Um, like I said, the Air Force was relatively mild compared to everything else. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I might have screwed up once, kind of. We, we, there was uh, another s a squadron that was next to us, and they were kind of our sister squadron. And there was always a competition between us and them who was the best. And uh, we, it, when you, um, you had to put your shoes below your bunk and they had to be in a perfect line with the post of the bunk. So that if you put a board at the corner of the bunk, or the level with the legs, all of the toes of the shoes had to touch. But 
allegedly we weren't supposed to have a board, but we did, because that's how we lined up our shoes. But we had to hide it whenever the other inspector came in. Well, one day, unfortunately, he showed up a little earlier than I expected, and so I was holding this eight-foot, one-by-four board in the middle of the room, and um, I knew I was going to get in trouble if he saw me with it, uh, so I ran out the fire door and uh, went running down the stairs, not knowing what I was going to do with this board. And right at the bottom of the stairs was our sister's squad leader. And he's going to go, oh, where are you going with that? <laughs> so they yelled at me. I think they thought it was funny more than anything else, although they didn't let on that to me, but I, I just got yelled at. Oh, okay. All right. So how long did basic last? It was uh, eight weeks. Is that right? That was standard in the Army at that yeah. point. So. Six weeks. I think it's but six It could have been six weeks. Yeah, it was shorter. It was shorter than everything else. And I think that's part of the reason that I picked the Air Force, too, is they had the shortest basic training. I'm thinking, that's a good deal. Okay. Uh, and once you complete basic training, what do they do with you? You know, again, probably I'm atypical, but uh, I waited around before I could go to tech school. I was on my way to tech school, but tech school wasn't ready yet for me, and so I ended up cleaning and painting and you know doing other tasks that need to be done on the base for about I don't know two or three weeks, and then I went to my tech school. Okay, and where was that? Goodfellow, Texas. No, oh, Goodfellow of Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas. Okay, and where in the state is San Angelo? It's the heart of West Texas. Okay. So pretty much middle of nowhere. Middle of nowhere. <laughs> uh, maybe about two hours from Mexico, but you know. Okay. And how big was the base in terms of how many people do you think were there? Oh uh, boy, I'd be surprised if it was more than a thousand. I mean, it was small. Okay. And what kind of technical training were you getting there? Um, our, our training was broken up into uh, a nine week section and then a uh, a 12-week section for a total of 21 weeks and uh, the first section was basic stuff because what they were doing at that point was doing our security clearances and so um, what happened is they were doing our security clearances so um, it gave the FBI or whoever was doing those time to figure that out and so at the end of nine weeks if you passed then you went on to the next section Okay. And so if you did middle of the night, you were gone. Okay. So how are they actually filling the nine weeks? Um, really, really basic stuff that really didn't make a lot of, you know, it was just basic stuff. I don't know. We, um, it was confidential, but um, one of the things was typing. We had to type, um, and uh, I didn't know how to type. And the way the Air Force teaches you how to type is um, <laughs> the, the, the keys on the typewriter have no letters. And there's a chart up on the wall. So all you can do is just put your fingers on there, and look up at the chart, and hope your fingers are going where the chart is telling you they're supposed to go. Okay. Did that work? Yes. Yeah. No, clearly it did. Yeah. It worked really well. Um, yeah, because I learned how to type. The other thing that happened too is typing was uh, at, at the end of the day. And so if you knew how to type, you got to go drinking with everybody else. Mm -hmm. If you didn't know how to type, you sat there for as many weeks as it took you before you could get 60 words a minute. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and aside from typing, were they teaching sort of technical things relating to radios or communications or... Uh, that kind of stuff? Um, sure. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, I don't even remember what they taught us. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, um, they taught us code and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, we had to learn Morse code and things like that. So, 
some of that was the basic stuff, mm-hmm. you know. And of course, I'd been a Boy Scout, so I knew kind of some of those already. Some of them, well, SOS at least I knew. <laughs> but so we learned some of those kind of things. All right. Now, was there ever actually an occasion to use Morse code once we were on duty anywhere? You know, uh, what I did was was top secret, mm-hmm. and so I don't know. I know it's probably declassified at this point, but it makes me uncomfortable talking about it and you know, okay. being specific. Okay. Yeah, that's still a fairly broad kind of question. Well, yeah, 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 it yeah. is. Do you use Morse code or not? But uh, well. I, I can tell you, and this this tells you a little bit about the service, I can tell you to this day verbatim exactly what my job description was, the unclassified version. Okay. And, and and I would bet that if you looked back 48 years or whatever it was and looked it up, I'll get it word for word. And then as I monitored Air Force communications to ensure that there were no security leaks or compromises with the enemy. Okay. All right. So you get through not your... what I did, but you know okay. that's what <laughs> that's the story. <laughs> All right. So you basically spend nine weeks of, of what is sort of warm up and basic yeah, yeah. skills and waiting you out, and now you move on to your twelve weeks. Right. Uh, and now is this stuff that's gearing you toward that that, that very specific job or yes, you, yeah. yeah, that very specific job. Yeah. So that by the time you get out of that that twenty one weeks, you, you're ready to go. Okay. Now. What were you? What would you do when you were not training? Um, there was a lot of drinking. Um, we Texas. The, the nice thing about Texas is there's some really great steakhouses, so we loved going into mm-hmm. the steakhouses. Uh, there was a lake nearby that we went to. Uh, one time, a couple guys and I uh, went down to Mexico um, for some souvenirs. <laughs> well, one guy wanted to get, uh, it wanted to be in a relationship with a young lady for a short period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, we also, we went camping, things like that, you know, as a group. How did the people in the community view the servicemen on the base? Uh, I think they liked us because we had money. Mm-hmm. We had a lot of disposable income and, and we spent it. <laughs> All right. And because we had, you know, we had a place to live and we had food, mm-hmm. so it's like, yeah, okay. Okay, so whatever else you had, you could just spend Well, and we were young and stupid, and it's like, yeah, let's go. All right. Did some of the guys have cars? I did. Yeah. Yeah, some guys did. Most didn't. Uh, my roommate had a motorcycle. All right. Uh, and so now... If you think back at the time you spent in the various stages of training, are there other things that kind of stand out in your memory about those experiences? Yeah, to be honest, other than typing, I don't even remember what they taught us. <laughs> um, but I do know that, you know, as much as the 21 weeks were supposed to get you ready, you know, you got to the job on your first base and you're like, they didn't teach me this, <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay. You had to learn stuff, but uh, yeah, I think I had a basic understanding of what I was supposed to do. And okay. So in your case, you, you, you finish the, the, the 12 week cycle. Uh, where do they send you? Well, I'm going to brag a little bit. Um, for the 21 weeks, they had a, we had a test every Friday, and uh, my average at the end of the 21 weeks was 98.54, and so I was top of the class. And so, because I was top of the class, I got my choice. And and they did say, well, you could go to, you know, Vietnam, or you could go to Alaska, or you could go to Florida, or England. And I was like, well, this is a no-brainer. I'm taking England. Mm-hmm. You know, they speak our language. It's a foreign country. You're you're going to pay to fly me over. Party on. Let's go. Okay. So I went to England. All right. Uh, and can you say where in England you were based? I was based at RAF Chicksands, which is in Chicksands, uh, which is near Shefford, which is about 50 miles north of London. Okay. Now, is this an area, that, a place that had been an air base during World War II, or was it a newer facility? Or? Okay. <clears throat> I was in the Air Force. In the four bases I was at, 
only one head of plane, and that was a Cessna that the base commander used. <laughs> okay. I was in intelligence, you mm -hmm. know, and so where I was wasn't where the planes were. Okay. All right. Um, and so what kind of um, living quarters and facilities did you have there? We had barracks, two, two guys to a room. Uh, I don't know, it had to be 10 by 10. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have been much more than that. Okay. And what was the routine like there? The worst schedule I've ever had. Uh, we, uh, because we were intelligence and we had to man the, the base 24 hours a day, 365, we were on a rotating schedule. We worked four uh, swing shifts, took 24 hours off, then four midnight shifts, took 24 hours off, then did four day shifts, and then had 96 hours off. Repeat. Okay, uh, and in, in how many people work in a shift, or to what extent were you, were you on your own? Or no, no, it was, uh, we, uh, there was four flights, mm -hmm. Air Force flights, um, Abel, Baker, Charlie, and Dog, and so you know one of them was doing one of each one of the three shifts, yeah. and then one was off. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was on Baker flight. Okay, and when you were off, what did you do? There might have been some drinking. Okay. <laughs> we we did a lot of things. Um, the base was really good because it was just intelligence. I mean that was our our main focus, mm -hmm. and so they fed us incredibly well. Um, and because we were on such a weird shift schedule, uh, the the mess hall was open all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you could go at midnight and get like they had an omelet bar, you know. Or if you wanted a steak, you could get a steak. You know, it was just really good food and always available. Uh, the base would open things up like the movie theater, you know, because we'd get off at a midnight, especially that last one where you got 24 hours to go. You don't want to go to sleep right away because then you're going to wake up at 8 in the morning and then have to go to work at midnight. That didn't work out well. So what we did was they would open up the theater. You know, we could go watch movies. Uh, we had uh, the bowling alley was open. Yeah, there was a rec hall. Uh, all sorts of things like that on base that we could do. Was this all on American base? Yes. Okay. But there must have been a fair number of you there if they had all those kinds of facilities. Yes. Okay. Well, there's no planes, so you think, okay. Right. All right. This is just a big operation. Y yeah. Uh, I would bet there was probably 300 people just on my flight. You know, and then you've got a lot of support people as well, so, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, now, would you, on the time off, was that, would you get enough time to go into London or anything like that? Yes, yeah, we did. We, uh, especially because we had that 96 hours off, you mm -hmm. know, at the end, um, we had a chance to do a lot of stuff. Uh, and plus, also, we had our regular leave, our 30 days of leave. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and you could take that in one big chunk, which one year I did. Um, and two buddies and I rented a VW bus, camper bus, and drove throughout Europe. So, okay. You had, let's see, of course, in England, you, so if you rent, did you rent it in England and have to yeah. drive on the wrong side and then take that yeah. over to Europe with you? Yeah. The, the hardest part of driving on the wrong side, which, and I had a car on base as well, the hardest part was for me at least, was backing out of a parking space and making sure I was in the right lane. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you kind of get used to it. Okay. You know. And then go over to Europe and they're driving on the right side of the road again. <laughs> it's very complicated. <laughs> uh, there might have been one time when, I think we were in Brussels or something, that maybe I went in the tram lane rather than like a car lane because I didn't read the signs and I didn't know. Maybe one time I was in a bike lane, I, you know, there was a lot of things. But did you hit anybody? Did not hit anybody. There you go. <laughs> that kind of takes care of that. So how long were you based in England? I was there three years. Okay. Uh, and did you stay on that same base the whole time, or did you move around? I did. Same base. Yeah, in fact, it was a two-year two, two year assignment, and then I just extended because I was having such a great time. I got to know a lot of the locals, you know, we could go to the pubs and stuff. 
in the town around us, so I got to know a lot of people. All right. So what are the dates for when you go to England and when you leave? Uh, it would have been December of 73 through December of 76. Okay. So a bunch of different things were going on in the country, in our country and in, in the world at, at that time. There's the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, there is all the Watergate and Nixon stuff and all of that kind of thing. And then you get the Bicentennial in 1976. Yeah. Uh, to what extent did any of that stuff resonate where you were? Uh, I think they tried to make things as normal as possible. I mean, we, we it, it's a military base. Mm -hmm. So the Watergate thing, it's like, yeah, you, can, you know, let's not deal with that. Um, but the Bicentennial, we had a big celebration. And it was kind of interesting because then uh, the town people love to come on the base and, you know, see the fireworks and, you know, see us playing baseball and, you know, all those kind of things. Of course, you were celebrating independence from England. Well, you know. But they'd gotten over it. <laughs> yes. Yes. And in fact, uh, one time I was in Ireland uh, in this little pub. And there had to be maybe, uh, at most, maybe 20 people could have fit in this pub. And my two buddies and I were, were there, and we were talking, and they said, you know, as soon as we start talking, the Irish guys were like, oh, yanks. And we're going, yeah, sorry, yeah, we are. He goes, ah, oh, you guys were the greatest. And I go, well, what, what made us the greatest? And he goes, ah, during the Great War, you know, you guys would go over and, you know, fly and bomb middle of the day. You didn't care. You know, but those damn English, you know, they'd sneak over there at night. I'm like, oh, okay. I don't think I had any responsibility for that, but go Yanks, yeah. <laughs> you know. All right. Uh, now, are there, you're there, it's still cold, you're there on a Cold War mission, essentially. Yes. Um, did you have uh, any actual alerts, or did you run drills periodic for what would happen if X or Y was going on? Yeah, it was the military. You gotta have drills. And, and, and I think that's the reason I didn't re-enlist. Uh, there was nothing worse than getting off a day shift, you know, maybe going into the pub and having more than a few pints of beer, and they had really good beer. Um, and then coming back, going to sleep at midnight, you know, and then 2 a.m., the alarms go off and you have to go up to the compound, you know, for an inspection and a drill but it was really just a uniform inspection. You know, and so then you're up there from two until like four, four thirty, and it's like you have to go back to work at eight. It's like, now what? <laughs> you know, so you just go over to the mess hall and have something to eat and hang around. So it, yeah, we had a lot of drills. You know, were there any situations where you really didn't know what was going on or thought this might be something bigger? We always thought it was something. Uh, you know, but after a while, I guess in the beginning we did, and after a while you go, okay, another uniform inspection. But the military trained you that, it, okay, we're practicing because it could happen. Mm -hmm. So you're always like, well, maybe this is a drill, and maybe not. So you just never knew. All right. During the course of time you were there, did you get any promotions? Yes. Yes. I ended up being a sergeant. Okay, uh, and for what grade of sergeant? Just the lowest level. E three, okay. I think. Yeah. Oh. And the I came in as an E one. Yeah. It, it, but see, and here's the problem. At that point, because Vietnam was ending, promotions were slowing down. Yeah. And so it took longer for you to get them. So I, I, I got it on as quick as I could. I don't think I was behind, you know. But I wasn't real motivated to do anything special. All right. Um, now, are there, and then what kind of, did you work with officers much at all, or were you largely with a smaller group of enlisted? or Mostly enlisted. Um, for our Baker flight, we had, we had a flight commander who was a second lieutenant, which was interesting because he was almost as young as we were. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was interesting, but uh, we didn't. We, we dealt we, uh, we had to deal with the base commander because um, he was a weirdo. Um, he would sit in his office with binoculars 
and watch people going up to the compound, going up to work, and if he thought your hair was too long, he would send the SPs to go get you and take you to the barber shop. The SPs, that's security police? Security police, yeah, yeah. Okay. MPs. MPs in the Army and yeah, the SPs. Secu- yeah, we changed names just right. because. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> you remember like, what rank he was? He was a colonel, okay. Colonel George. I don't know his last name, but Colonel George was his name, and uh, he was a haircut fanatic. <laughs> well, he may not have had that much else to do. That could be true. Yeah, because we were, I mean, we, we did what we were supposed to do, you know, and so I don't know that he really had much to do. Okay. Did you have a group of more senior NCOs who were kind of almost permanent staff there, or were most of you rotating in and out like you? Most of everybody was rotating in and out. Uh, there were some day shift people, but even they rotated in and out. We called them day ladies, but... Okay. But were there any women personnel in the base? Yes. Yeah. Um, not a lot. She's uh, on our flight of 300, I would say maybe 40, 50. Okay. And do they limit what kinds of jobs they could have? No, they were the same. Okay. Same as us at that point. And do you have any sense of how they were treated or how they got along with the male personnel? <laughs> got along very well with me. <laughs> no, they got along really well with everybody. Um, I think it still was pretty a sexist environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, maybe they got harassed a little bit more than, you know, the guys did. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking one example, but, I, um, you know, if they were new and stuff, the, one of the NCOs would have them do the uh, EMHO report. You know, it's like, hey, go around and check with all the guys, and, you know. Find out what the EMO at H status is like. Like, okay. So they'd go around, you know, everybody give them, what well, was early morning hard on? Oh, it was the report. You know, so you'd get things like, fine, or, you know, hard, hard today, you know, or, or six and going, or, you know, you'd get goofies. Everybody would give different things, you know, and we would just be laughing. But we, we did a lot of goofy things. Um, not, not just to the girls, too, because in an eight-hour shift, um, there was not always eight hours of activity, especially midnight. You know, especially midnight on Christmas or New Year's, you know, when the world is kind of sleeping. There's not a lot going on. And so we would do all sorts of goofy things. We had uh, printer paper uh, in, back in the old days, with the little uh, edges, yeah. with the holes in them that you could rip off. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you rip those off and you get about 20 feet of that, and then you put a paper clip in one of the holes and make a hook out of the paper clip, and then when somebody's walking by, you clip it in the back of their belt, belt loop, and then they go walking away with 30 feet of, <laughs> of paper following them. You know, it's that kind of stuff that we just tried to entertain ourselves with. Did you ever do anything working with any of the NATO allies at all, or the British? Or yes, yeah, we worked with the the Brits mostly. We were in their country, so. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know I did. I, I don't know if anybody else did anything else. I, again, being a security, um, you only did what you needed to know, mm-hmm. you know. So they weren't going to tell you anything else. Yeah, I dealt with the Brits. And that's what I know. I don't know if we dealt with anybody else. All right. Um, to think back about the time that you, you spent in England, are there other particular memories that stand out for you that you're allowed to share? Yeah. Uh, well, I remember what, one of the things we had to do on midnight shifts is uh, we had a, we had people had burn detail. Every everything everything in that building uh, got burned. Nothing went out. Every piece of paper, if you had a Kleenex, it would get burnt. And so one of the things Midnight Shift did was all these bags of accumulated paper, and we would have to burn them. And then not only burn them, but then 
clean out the furnace and uh, you know make sure that there were no scraps of paper that might have even you know a quarter of an inch that might have had some code or some magic message on it so that was annoying um, some of the things on the base were kind of normal um, I ended up getting involved with the Boy Scouts you know and I was the Boy Scout leader for the the troop on base mm -hmm. um, and then one of the guys from the town who was the scout master of the English troop was my assistant and then I was his assistant for the troop in town okay so it was, you know it was nice we had kind of an exchange and stuff um, it, it was it was nice we, uh, I learned how to ski in Scotland you know, one of those four or ninety-six hour day or ninety-six hour periods. Mm -hmm. um, Thirty of us from the same flight took a bus up to Scotland and went and learned how to ski. You know, so we did a lot of traveling and stuff. So it was nice. All right, and the British people generally liked you, or um, they liked their income. Uh, the guys did not like the fact that some of their women liked us and wanted to get married to us so that we could bring them back here. Mm -hmm. um, there was some a little bit of grief there. Um, I, I was telling a friend of mine a story last night. Uh, I went to this one pub. I always went to this one pub. And, and back in those days, they were on World War II hours where they would open up for lunch 11 to 2 mm -hmm. and then they would close so the factory workers would go back and they would open up back again 7 to 10 and then they're done. Um, and so I spent a lot of time there for 7 to 10 when I could during days and uh, I got to know a bunch of the guys and it wasn't until a year I'd been going there, a year, um, that 10 o'clock came and the pub owner, Mike, is like, okay, everybody, you know, hustle out. And he, he turns to me and he goes, kid, they called me the Chicago kid because mm -hmm. I was from Chicago. He goes, kid, just, just sit there and drink a drink. I go, okay. And I'm thinking, oh, no, there's some weird tradition or something. <laughs> and I, and I'm going to get in trouble here. And so, you know, he shuffles everybody out except for like three, three of the local guys, regulars. Turns the lights off, locks the door, and he goes, "If if the Bobby's come, just tell him you're finishing that one up." And I go, "Oh, okay." Well, we sat there until three o'clock in the morning, and, and that happened all the time. You know, if you were okay. Mm -hmm. So it took me a year before they accepted me and said, "Yeah, this guy can hang around." So I mean, it was a great experience. If if I was the ruler of the world, I think every kid who graduates high school should have to go to a foreign country for a year. I don't care if it's Peace Corps or religious, you know, event or service or whatever, just to get that exposure. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good experience. All right. Uh, at what point, I mean, did you ever consider actually staying in? Or was it No, I think it was those goofy drills that just drove me crazy and it's like, uh, you know, I, I don't care if my shoes are shined or not, <laughs> you know. So. so was that still an issue on that base? Did you still have to fall through all the spit and polish stuff? A little bit, but because we were intelligence, they were a, a pretty lax. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we didn't have a lot of inspections. And in fact, I remember in our dorm, we could hire a maid. And so, you know, the whole floor hired this maid and she came and cleaned our rooms. All right. Okay. So, but you did extend for a year. So, well, yes, at that base, mm -hmm. yeah, because it was like, I, why do I want to go somewhere else? I'm having a good time here. Oh, okay. So you would have, since you you still had time left on your enlistment. Yes. It was just a question of staying there, or going somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, I actually got out um, four months early because I should have gone till April, but I got out in December because I got there in December. I stayed for two years and then extended for one year. Mm -hmm. And so rather than extend me for four months, they said, yeah, see you later. Okay. Did you go back to the States at all during your time over there? I did not. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the guys did. You know, they'd go for home for Christmas or whatever. 
um, and my attitude was, I'm in England. I don't know when I'm ever going to come back here. Chicago is always going to be there, you know. I, I'm going to go back and live there. So I took the time, all my leave, and traveled, you know, Ireland, Germany, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, you know, wherever. Any chance I could get. One time, a friend and I had the same birthday. And, you know, he goes, where do you want to go for a birthday? And I go, Brussels. And he goes, okay. So we took the weekend and went to Brussels for our birthday. You know, it was just that easy. Okay. Um, I don't know. How good was the dollar at that point? I mean, how far did your money go? Um, far enough. <laughs> you know, I think the pound was about two bucks. I think when I first got there, it was about two fifty um, per pound, and then I think it got down to less than less than two bucks by the time I left. Uh, and as you went to different countries, were they usually could they tell you were U.S. military with the haircuts and all that? Or yes, yeah, generally they could. Although um, we had to be careful in traveling. Um, Especially because of our clearance, we couldn't go over or into any country that was hostile, or you know, to the United States. So we had to be real careful. Okay. So you're basically in Western Europe, but did you get to Switzerland? Yeah, yeah, we Switzerland. I went to Switzerland, Austria. Did you get to Berlin? No. Okay. No, couldn't. Well, you could go to West Berlin, but you'd have to. But that would get more complicated. Yeah, no, yeah. no. Berlin was off the list. Okay. So. All right. Uh, so now, so you kind of get so get to 1976. And in, and in fact, um, we could. I remember this. We could travel on our military ID, mm -hmm. and we didn't need a passport. But we were highly encouraged to get a passport, so that people couldn't tell that we were mm -hmm. military. Uh, and one time I was going to take a picture in my uniform for the passport, and they were like, nope, not happening, put on civilian clothes, so, so we did. Okay. Uh, did you notice any place, any kind of leftover counterculture hostility to military or anti-war stuff? No. No. I don't, I don't remember yeah. any. Well, it didn't affect Europeans the way it did us to begin with, so yeah. it, was, it wasn't their war. No. Um, most everybody was pretty friendly and, and helpful. I remember um, in France the, with the VW bus, uh, this was just towards the end of the trip. You know, we'd made a great circle. We were coming back. We are in the middle of France somewhere, and... Uh, and the engine blew up, you know? And of course, the other two guys and I didn't speak that much French, none. And so we're just ugly Americans. And so we're at the side of the road and this VW bus, there's just oil all over the place. And uh, this one couple stopped and the guy came out and my two friends are trying to explain to him that they, they think we blew a rod or something in the engine. You know, and he's looking at it, and he goes, oh, oh, we, we, oil. And, and they're going, no, 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 don't think it's oil. You know, and I was talking to the wife, and I go, I, I was trying to explain, I was trying to figure out how to tell her the engine's dead. And finally I said, uh, engine kaput. And she goes, oh, we, oui, we, oui, kaput. You know, <laughs> then she explained to her husband what had happened, you know, the engine kaput. And he goes, oh, you know, and, and so then the weird thing was they spoke English. I mean, they, they knew English but they didn't feel comfortable speaking it. And so I asked them, I said, would you take me to a phone so we could get, you know, a tow truck? And we, we you know, and I sat in the back of their car. They would talk to each other in front of French and, and confer, and then they would ask me a question in English, and then I'd give them the question, they'd confer again. And so they, they, they were really nice. They took me to a pub, or a bar, and we, we got a tow truck to come, and then they found us a, um, a bed and breakfast to stay at, and the people at the bed and breakfast were incredibly helpful, you know, calling 
the, the repair shop, how are things going, calling the automobile club to say, hey, we need another vehicle. I mean, it would, so, yeah, so I think people were really friendly towards yeah. us. Because there you were also in the French provinces, and in the provinces they're often nicer than they are in Paris. Yes. I got stuck in an elevator in Paris once, but people were there were friendly, although they did say it would take three hours for somebody to come and repair the <laughs> elevator. I, I don't think that was a hostility. I think it was just yeah. the repair guy lived out in the suburbs or something. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else from the European trip here that you can throw in? Oh, I, I have many stories, most of them. No, I, you know, I mean, it was just such a great time traveling with the friends and, and uh, it's experiences that, you know, okay. I'll remember forever. All right, so you get finished. So were you able to negotiate the four months uh, early out or do they just offer that? That's pretty standard. Okay. All right. Uh, and so then when you get out, what do you do? One of the, a couple of the guys said, hey, when you get out, you can apply for unemployment. I go, what are you talking about? They're like, no, no, you can get unemployment because you're, I go, really? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And so I applied for unemployment. And I, it bothered me that I was doing it, but at the same time I was like, wait a minute, I can sit around and watch TV at home and, and you're gonna send me a check for doing nothing? I mean, that was really hard to say, oh, that doesn't make sense. So I did that for a while, but in the meantime, I was really waiting for college to start. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I ended up going to college then. So where did you go to college? Well, I started at University of Illinois in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, hated it. Uh, it was way too big. Um, lecture hall with 300 people with a professor about you know that yeah. size, yeah. the bottom of the, the hall. Um, I always felt that you could have died and nobody would have noticed you unless you actually slumped over into the aisle, you know. And so um, I didn't like that. I went there a year, and then I transferred to George Williams College, which is a smaller university. In the meantime, I had no clue what I wanted to do, and so I went to the VA, and I said, because uh, I knew they had career counseling. Mm -hmm. They go, oh, you should be an outdoor recreation guy. And I go, oh, okay. And I started kind of doing that. I was thinking, oh, I don't know that I want to be outdoors, you know, when it's 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up moving into social work. All right. So did you wind up as a, as a career as a social worker? Or? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And the and the VA helped me uh, with my tuition and books and all that kind of stuff. I ended up graduating with a master's of social work. And I became a, a school social worker and had a career doing that. Okay. Were you with Chicago Public Schools or something? No, uh, suburban high schools. Okay. And which suburbs were you in? I was in uh, Roselle, uh, Wilmette, Roselle. I have to go in order of those. I don't remember. <laughs> Wheeling, uh, Mount Prospect. Okay. Uh, and then when did you retire? Retired in uh, 2010. Okay. Uh, and these days you, you spend a lot of time on a boat? I do. Yeah. I, uh, when I, reti I retired early because mm -hmm. I, I just had it. I was done. I retired earlier than I should have. Um, but retirement is such a weird thing. It's like, you know, why are you retiring when you're too old and, you know, not in as good a shape as you were when you were 18 to do stuff? So I retired early thinking I would maximize my time. Um, ended up a couple years ago, I bought a boat, and so I spent a lot of time on my boat now. All right. Now, at the beginning of the interview, you said something about not being able to swim. Yes. So how do you go from not being able to swim to, to living on a boat? Yeah, good point. Um, my previous boat was a 16-foot canoe with a trolling motor, um, and so when I was, I, I sold, a, I had a farm that I used to get away when I was working. And then when I retired, I didn't have any reason to get away. And so I sold the farm, then I had this chunk of money. And I thought, okay, well, I could I could do the adult thing and invest it. 
you know, or I could buy a winter house or I could buy a lake house. And I couldn't find anything lake house that I liked. And so, because I, I'm not a morning person and I don't like sunrises, I like sunsets. And so I couldn't find anything on the right side of the, the lake that I could do. But one guy had a boat and I thought, ta-da, if I had a boat, I could go see the sunset anywhere. And so I bought a boat. And I, before I did it, I called my two best friends and I go, yeah, um, can't swim, 16 foot canoe, thinking about being a, buying a big boat, what do you think? They're going, yeah, good idea. I was hoping my friends would like have better sense than I did, but apparently <laughs> not. <So you laughs> really, still, they know me well. Right, but you still don't swim? No. No, I'm, I'm like a rock. You know, I mean, I've taken swimming lessons, uh, and, you know, it's like, okay, just grab your knees and we'll do the jellyfish float, and you'll just float up to the top. Well, you know, after about three or four minutes on the bottom, I'm going, oh, yeah, this ain't working. You know, I'm done with this, so. All right, but no fear of water in the meantime. Well, no, not, not as long as I got a boat around me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I tend to wear my life jacket all the time, uh, just because. All right. Well, uh, actually, you know, while you, you could not divulge state secrets, you, you could tell <laughs> yeah. us quite a bit about what life in, your life in the, in the military was like, and that's really kind of what we're doing these things for. So I'd like to thank you for sharing the story today. You're welcome.